Um, thank you all for joining us this evening um, for Hamilton Act Two with Gil Harrell. Most of you know Gil, um, but in just in case you don't, he is a musicologist and music theorist whose interests include styles ranging from Western classical repertoire to jazz. Previously, he served at the faculty on Cooney Baruch uh, College, where he was awarded the prestigious Presidential Excellence Award for Distinguished Teaching, as well as the Southwestern University of Finance and Economics in Chengdu, China. Currently, he teaches at Naugatuck Valley Community College, where he was presented with the Merit Award for Exemplary Service to the College. At Naugatuck Valley Community College, Dr. Harrell conducts the College Chorale a cappella ensemble, teaches music history and theory, and serves as musical director of theater productions. Outside of teaching, he enjoys staying active as a pianist and vocalist. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections available to the community. And I hope everyone's ready to learn about Act Two. Thanks for being here tonight, Gil. Well, thank you, Pat, for that fabulous introduction. And of course, thank you to the Darien Library for making programs like this possible. I think uh, for many of us, there's a, a yearning, not only for the kind of uh, intellectual nourishment that comes with any academically oriented program, but in this case, I think it can be especially satisfying both to uh, learn a little bit about history and also to indulge in some really great music. So we're dipping our toes uh, in both the, uh, the realm of higher learning, but also in a pure hedonistic experience tonight. And that, that's a very wonderful balance to strike. So welcome uh, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for joining me, I should say. Um, we're gonna be talking about act two of Hamilton and of course, before we get into act two, I think it would be worthwhile just to recap a few of the, uh, the more uh, salient points regarding act one. In doing so, it will prepare us for what to expect and, and uh, some of the leitmotifs and major musical points which are gonna come up, which I'll emphasize during the course of tonight's lecture. Act one of Hamilton is inherently loaded with a lot of excitement. For example, we have the meeting of the lovers who will dominate the stage for the two acts, Alexandra and Eliza. And there's a wrinkle thrown in by Lin-Manuel Miranda, which is the relationship of uh, Angelica Schuyler, that, that is to say, uh, Eliza's, his wife, uh, that is Alexander's wife's sister, or his sister-in-law, who's part of a, a kind of a love triangle. And we'll talk more about that because it does come up in act two. It should be noted, however, that the romantic allusions to a relationship between Alexander and his sister-in-law are mostly fictional. The real Angelica Schuyler was in fact married by the time Alexander uh, and Eliza met. However, uh, that love uh, angle, if we can call it that, that romance, that triangle of affection is uh, I think one of the more iconic aspects of the Hamilton story, at least in the musical version. Moreover, some of the action in act one has to do with the uh, establishment of America as a sovereign and coet nation in the late 18th century. Um, and of course, it was not a, a quiet revolution. It was a violent one. The American Revolution uh, culminated in the Battle of Yorktown. And of course, uh, after that led to the, uh, the expulsion of the British forces from the American continent and therefore, um, you know, the opportunity for America to establish itself as a fledgling nation, as an autonomous and sovereign country. And as we know, we toss around this term all the time, founding father. We know that Hamilton uh, was an important member of that, that group of founding fathers. In fact, in the very first song of the musical, he's described as the $10 founding father, a uh, reference, of course, to the fact that his face, his countenance uh, adorns the $10 bill. So while there's action in act one, Eliza and Alexander meet, they get married. Um, we uh, meet uh, Alexander's rival, uh, Aaron Burr, 
And of course, uh, Burr gets a couple of really uh, important numbers, namely Wait For It, which takes place um, a little bit past the halfway mark in Act One. And then we get the Battle of Yorktown, which features uh, you know, very extravagant dancing and choral singing. And then we get to the end of Act One, where we hear the song Nonstop. And Nonstop is a really important song because it's going to set the stage for Act Two. Now, Nonstop could be described, at least in the first part, as a kind of a dialogue between Alexander and Aaron Burr. In fact, they're both kind of narrating how after the war, they both returned to New York. And they both uh, practice law not too far away from each other. And we get the feeling as audience members that this is really where the rivalry between the two characters begins to heat up. And of course, that rivalry is going to be at the center of Act Two because we know the story of Alexander Hamilton. And we know that it ends in 1804 in Weehawken, New Jersey, where he's shot in the rib cage and dies a day later. Um, and he's buried in, in Trinity Church in New York. So um, the obviously the uh, animosity, the acrimony, all of the uh, that conflict between Alexander and Aaron Burr, that's gonna be at the center of act two. But I would suggest that there are other important rivalries which are going to be introduced to the plot line, to the narrative, and they're very important as well. Probably second in importance to the Burr-Hamilton rivalry is the Hamilton-Jefferson uh, rivalry. And we'll talk quite a bit about um, Thomas Jefferson, both the historical Thomas Jefferson, but also the Thomas Jefferson presented to us in the musical in a role originated most iconically by David Diggs. Uh, we'll hear him sing, actually, it'll be up for the first number of the night when we listen to What Did I Miss, which is the opening number of Act Two. So Act One ends with this very up-tempo, fiery number, ends in the key of E minor with Alexander repeating something. He says a kind of motif that uh, comes up in the very beginning of Act One, I'm not throwing away my shot. And um, right before Act One ends, we get this moment where George Washington says to Alexander, I know it's really hard to abandon your wife and children, but I need you at my side. And Hamilton's answer is very telling. Without even asking, what do you need? He says to him, Secretary of Treasury or Secretary of State? That is to say, Treasury or State, for those of you who know the song. And Washington, after a pregnant dominant chord, answers. He says, Treasury. And then the song heats up for one final crash towards that E minor ending I talked about. In other words, Act One drives us towards this moment where the government is being established, where the banking system is going to be established, and Alexander Hamilton is in the center of things because he was Washington's, well, his right hand man, I guess you might say, his aide de camp in the days of the Revolutionary War, his secretary of sorts and eventually his legitimate secretary of the treasury. So Hamilton's role in the, uh, the, the history of American politics is uh, emphasized very much in the drama and the narrative of the way act one ends and the way it sets up act two. Now, there's something that we could certainly ask ourselves here, which is, you know, if act one is about the developing love between Alexander and Eliza and the, the developing rivalry between Burr and Hamilton, and of course, the, the battles and the clashes and the political developments that take place leading up to during and, and immediately after the Revolutionary War, where does that leave us for Act Two? Put another way, should we be excited as audience members knowing that Act Two is going to tackle such issues as states' rights versus federal power or the establishment of a, a Federalist Party versus a Democratic Republican Party? Are we interested in who ran for governor of New York in 1804? I think these are legitimate questions that we can ask. And on face value, the answer might be for many people, well, not really. The thought of uh, talking about, for example, to use one particular point, the compromise of 1790 and the establishment of a national capital and the idea of uh, banking power being consolidated in New York and Wall Street, does that, that might not interest uh, just you know the average uh, theater goer. It might interest people who are uh, fascinated by history and inclined to learn facts and dates and details of that nature. However, the great thing about Hamilton, one of the most, uh, I think, uh, lasting impacts that the musical will have is that it does uh, teach history 
to theater goers who might otherwise be ambivalent or nonchalant on the topic. Before I go on, I should probably say that on a scholarly level, there are many academics who would disagree with the notion that Hamilton is a, a great tool for teaching history because they would quibble with certain details that don't align with all of the historical facts that are available to scholars who pour through the documents and relics and artifacts of that period to cobble together the most accurate picture they can of the man Hamilton and the era he lived in. For example, there are some scholars who uh, have voiced objection to the notion that Hamilton in the musical is, is uh, di displayed and depicted and portrayed and uh, presented to us as a, a hardcore abolitionist. And those same scholars might point out that Alexander Hamilton may or may not have had house servants who may have been slaves, or that the musical doesn't um, depict um, Blacks who lived in, in both in free communi communities or even in slave communities. And all that's true, but I would just suggest to those scholars that any uh, stage work is necessarily to some degree going to be a work of fiction. And um, I think uh, I side more with the scholars who praise Lin-Manuel Miranda for uh, striving to be historically accurate while still creating a compelling drama, which um, nonetheless, despite its sometimes flawed or inaccurate storytelling, uh, makes for an irresistible narrative that, that can teach us a lot about American history. And of course, uh, for Miranda, he gets most of his information and most of his ideas from the Ron Chernow biography. And if you haven't read that, I can recommend a fantastic library in Darien that I would wager has at least a couple of copies of it that you can take out. So the, uh, the idea that Hamilton is inaccurate, that strikes me as something that would come up at a panel at an academic conference. You know the old joke about academics, they love to get together to argue more and more about less and less. And that's true in musicology, and it's, I would imagine, true in uh, historical academic conferences. So for our purposes tonight, we'll assume that most of what we're seeing is historically accurate, and where it is egregiously different from what actually transpired, I'll be certain to point that out. So ready for act two? Are you ready to learn about the establishment of America's banking system and the uh, consolidation of federal power? and the assumption of state debts. As I said, these don't seem on face value to be interesting topics and certainly not standard fodder for musical theater production, but that's exactly what we get in act two. And I think what we'll find is that Miranda strikes a really admirable balance between presenting us with historical um, phenomena that occurred, but also bringing us close to the humans uh, who are being depicted on stage, that is to say, we're going to go deep inside the personal lives of Hamilton, that is to say, Alexander Hamilton and his wife, Eliza Hamilton, and Aaron Burr to some degree, and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. We get to meet some of these characters and learn a little bit about them. Now, the first person we meet in Act Two is Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson has been absent up until this point because the narrative, the drama has unfolded on American soil. As we said, it's about the Revolutionary War and that period. And we know that for most of the 1780s, Jefferson was not in America. He was over, as Hamilton will accuse him in act two, getting high with the French. Well, I suppose by that he means drinking and carousing, and fraternizing and flirting, which is not, hard to imagine, of course. Jefferson was a noted Francophile, and this is something that his political detractors would uh, accuse him of and hold against him when he would run for office. Of course, that didn't stop him from getting elected uh, president, but we know exactly uh, how he got elected president. We know that it was a very close election and that eventually it was Alexander Hamilton who uh, at least played a role in tipping the scales in Jefferson's direction and, and thus ensuring the defeat of his longtime rival, Aaron Burr. I wanna talk a little bit about the music in the opening number of act two. The song is called, What Did I Miss? And I'll show you the score in a minute. If you don't read score, that's perfectly okay. You don't have to read score. Um, you'll be able, of course, to read the uh, text which is laid out for us here today, you can see that even spoken text or rap text can be rendered in musical notation. And this is the notation that we use 
these X's on the note heads. And um, this would be spoken, but it has to be spoken very rhythmically accurately. So if you're counting one, two, three, four, seventeen. Set, set, seventeen. Set, set, seventeen, seventeen, eighty nine. So it has to be done exactly rhythmically, and that's obvious because we can see here that the entire company is speaking in rhythmic unison. So we said that Hamilton has now been uh, appointed by Washington. He's been asked to serve as the Secretary of the Treasury. And of course, we know who's going to be working alongside him in the cabinet as Secretary of State. It's none other than Thomas Jefferson himself. Some of you may be wondering, what was the actual relationship like between Jefferson and Hamilton? We're going to talk quite a bit about that tonight. And uh, we won't just address it here when we talk about what did I miss, but we'll also talk about it uh, when we look at the room where it happened. And of course, I jokingly posted on Facebook before this program, join us in the Zoom where it happens. Um, the song that we're going to listen to today in the middle of the program is called The Room Where It Happens. And, um, arguably one of the standout songs in the entire playlist and a song that Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, actually described as uh, one of the two best songs in the whole show. And I guess by best he meant his favorites, one of his favorites. So Jefferson uh, arrives back from France and he's going to make his way from Virginia up to New York, which is sort of where this, the unofficial seat of government was at the time. He's going to meet Alexander Hamilton but he's gonna be cautioned by a fellow Virginian, someone who in the musical is depicted as something of a lackey or a sidekick. And that must be said is not accurate. Uh, James Madison uh, was every bit the towering figure that Jefferson was, but in the musical, he is depicted as a sort of ancillary character. Nonetheless, he's going to warn Thomas Jefferson in this song. And in doing so, in very brilliant fashion, Miranda's setting up a lot of the conflict and drama for Act Two. The conflict is about essentially those who are in favor of a more independent and agrarian lifestyle, namely Jefferson and his fellow Virginian Madison, and those who are more accustomed to the urban lifestyle and those who are advocating for more strongly centralized federal powers, especially in the realm of uh, fiscal responsibility and banking. And that, of course, would be Alexander Hamilton. So notice here. We get the, or the uh, ensemble is going to tell us all about uh, Jefferson. They're going to say here, you haven't met him yet. You haven't, he hasn't been on stage yet, essentially, because he's been off as the ambassador to France. But you simply must meet him. You must meet Thomas Thomas. And then the, the uh, ensemble sings this great sliding, silky smooth chromatic. Thomas Jefferson's coming home. He's been off in Paris for so long. And then this slow tune for backbeat comes in these uh, modally inflected chords that suggest a, a Dorian mode for those of you who are music theory fans here come in. And um, what it is, is what that means is that it's musically kind of ambiguous. It hugs the boundary between major and minor. It's not happy, it's not sad. It's silky, it's seductive, it's uh, ambiguous. And uh, Jefferson begins to sing. So here's David Diggs from the original cast of, uh, of the Hamilton uh, company and he's singing, what did I miss the opening number from act two? And let's just say we are sharing sounds, fantastic. And here is, what did I miss? All right, we'll pause it right there. For those of you who are keeping track, the music that accompanies Burr's introductory narration here is uh, not note for note, but almost note for note, the same music that starts the musical. So there's a kind of a, uh, a mirror image here between act one and act two. They both start in the key of B minor, if that means anything to you. If it doesn't, that's fine. And they both uh, follow the same exact chord pattern, only here it's put into this silky shuffle, which I think is perfectly appropriate for the character of Jefferson, or at least how Thomas Jefferson is portrayed in the musical. We. Um, Continue now, the music begins to intensify. We haven't met him yet. You haven't had the chance. He's been kicking butt as the ambassador to France. Here we go. You gotta love this kind of writing. Those of you who are like me, who are enamored of, of acapella uh, breaks in the middle of an instrumental piece, you notice the, the band cuts out here. 
and the ensemble is left to sing that silky chromatic music that I talked about earlier. And chromatic here comes from a Greek word meaning colorful and just means using all of these tones that are sort of between the tones that belong to the key. So um, it really sets the stage beautifully for Jefferson's entrance. And notice that ambiguity I talked about in the tonality. That doesn't, it's hard to kind of put your finger on what key this is in. Uh, the key signature hasn't changed, so it could suggest D major, but you know, all of that music theory, which sounds like gobbledygook to many people, um, you don't have to know what it is to be able to perceive these sounds I'm talking about. And again, the sound here is one of tonal ambiguity. We haven't met Jefferson yet, so it makes perfect sense to introduce him with tones and sounds that don't really betray too much, don't give us too much of an indication of who he is and what he's about. So here is his uh, music now. The beat is going to be cut in half. It's now very slow, and Jefferson is going to sing. Another quick pause. Everybody notice the line here? A very quick, quick aside that can escape one's notice if you're not really paying attention. Of course, here it pays to have the score. He arrives back from France. He gets back to Virginia to his office. There's a letter from Washington. And he says, haven't even put my bags on yet. Sally, be a lamb, darling, once you open the letter. Of course, Sally here, we know who Sally is. It's Sally Hemings, uh, whose relationship with Thomas Jefferson has been documented in many uh, many scholarly articles and, uh, and has attracted attention as being one of the early uh, sex scandals of American history. This is uh, just one of a couple of sex scandals we're going to discuss tonight. Of course, the other one is, is an important part of the Hamilton uh, second act. So this boogie-woogie piano style, did everyone notice this uh, left-hand piano figure doubled with the bass guitar that gives us um, a style that's evocative of early 20th century jazz? Uh, some of this is evocative of what's called Dixieland jazz or traditional New Orleans jazz. And uh, some of it has a little bit of um, chromatic funkiness woven in. There's an improvisatory feel to it. It's heavily syncopated, syncopated meaning that a lot of these hits come off the beat, something like this, ba, 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 ba. And all of these hits in the uh, piano in the orchestra uh, don't always coincide with what Jefferson sings. So there's a lot of rhythmic dissonance here. And it's great. Even this line here, the way they sing heading to New York, you know, tonally speaking, this is a quite a weird melody to sing. I'll back it up just 10 seconds so you could hear that. So many great things about this, and we'll only have time to mention a few more of them before we move on because um, there's a lot to cover in Act Two, obviously. One of my favorite uh, things that Miranda does throughout the musical is how he uses character leitmotifs, these little melodic cells that refer to very specific characters or sometimes places or events. It's very Wagnerian, to be honest. Those of you who are familiar with the works of Richard Wagner will be familiar with the term leitmotif. And I don't think it's inappropriate to refer to these as leitmotifs. For example, when Hamilton introduces himself, he says, he speaks, one, two, three, Mr. Jefferson, and then he sings, Alexander Hamilton. So even though it's just a beat and a, you know, it's two beats, uh, four beats spread across, uh, uh, you know, uh, the bar line, it's amazing. It's just a, a little uh, reference to Hamilton's primary leitmotif, which you can hear all the way back in the very first number, this idea of Alexander Hamilton. It comes up over and over again. And it's just such a clever way to remind the audience, give them that, that, um, that oral cue of exactly who's introducing uh, himself to, and to whom. And uh, obviously if we're watching a fully staged production, we don't need to wonder, but if you were just listening to the soundtrack, having an oral cue like that is pretty cool. And we'll see more of that later on. All right. Uh, there's a whole lot that happens in act two and I'm kind of gonna uh, go through a little bit of the, uh, the broad points. We will listen to the next number, the second number of Act Two. It's called Cabinet Battle One. There are two cabinet battles in the act. And what I love about this is um, we can time it with our own, uh, I would say, a, uh, a, uh, an apex, an apogee in political uh, acrimony, which has been taking place over the last year, arguably. And not to make a political statement, I think that's an empirical fact wherever uh, one happens to stand uh, on either side of the political aisle. Um, but what, what I love about Hamilton is that it conveys to the audience with a great degree of accuracy uh, the notion, factual, that 
this idea of political acrimony, this idea that politicians despise one another and would hurl sometimes pejorative ad hominem insults at one another um, over political disagreements is not something that's exclusive either to the 21st century or even to the modern era. Uh, this is something that goes all the way back to the earliest days of the country's establishment and, and its uh, inchoate phase of existence. So um, I think that these cabinet battles are nicely compact pieces that convey that uh, that idea and, and acrimony here, you know, what we're talking about is uh, is feelings of resentment, um, posturing and political peacocking. And sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, nothing less than uh, than ad hominem insults. Uh, occasionally, you know, they wouldn't have used expletives in those days. Um, certainly, it would have been considered ungentlemanly to do that in the chambers of Congress. However, you'll see in cabinet battle number one that the disdain that Hamilton and Jefferson start to develop for one another is, uh, is front and center. And it should be said that that, um, that relationship, which began to sour, uh, really took place in the early 1790s. That is to say, within a year or two of Hamilton and Jefferson becoming acquainted with, with one another. There's ample evidence in the, uh, the scholarly sources that suggest that in the first year, the two were actually quite cordial and in fact, Hamilton was even invited to dine at Jefferson's uh, personal residence for dinner on occasion. However, uh, as they got deeper into politics, they began to disagree more vehemently. And the, uh, the critical point here, as we'll see, this is gonna be not just front and center in the next number, but also in our focal point for act two, which is called the room where it happens. Uh, the issue is about um, the, the consolidation of power. Should it be uh, on a federal level, that is to say centralized, or should it be more local on the state level? And to give you a, a background, well, we said that Jefferson served as ambassador to France and spent much of the 1780s in France. And Jefferson, who had grown up in Virginia and was used to an agrarian lifestyle, felt that um, after, especially after spending time in Europe, that strong centralized state government was not dissimilar from the European monarchies, which he was keen to see overthrown. In fact, um, you'll notice the first line he sings in What Did I Miss is France is following us to revolution. And uh, that's, that was true in 1789, France did uh, enter a revolutionary period. They weren't calling it that in, in the summer of 1789, but of course that's what historians uh, would, would refer to the storming of the Bastille in August of that year. So um, for Jefferson, the idea of toppling monarchy and abolishing the old way was very central to his political ideology, and the, the tenets he believed in. Whereas for Alexander Hamilton, who, yes, we know he grew up in the, in the Caribbean and on the island of Nevis and was, was uh, able to come to New York as a teenager. No one's sure exactly how old he was. Was he 15 or 17? It's hard to uh, deduce that because he lied about his age. However, um, they had a fundamental disagreement. Hamilton, who had moved to the big city and was a, um, used to the, the cosmopolitan lifestyle of a city dweller, uh, believed that power should be in the hands of a strong federal government. And of course, um, we know that he would, would write extensively to defend these ideas. In fact, the end of Act One, um, Burr has this amazing narration where he talks about how Hamilton invites certain people to, to uh, contribute to the Federalist Papers. And then of course he himself winds up writing something like 70% of all the Federalist Papers. So um, that's really the, at the core of the disagreement between these two historical figures, but enough about that. Let's listen to the music. Many things I love about the cabinet battle music, but uh, I'll, let me show you the score and then I'll tell you what they are. One of the things I love about this is uh, purely on a, as, a, as a professor of music theory and um, as someone who reads notated music all the time, um, I'm amazed at how accurately and faithfully um, Miranda's ideas could be transcribed here, could be rendered in sheet music form. The reason I say that is because this is a style of music which is often performed extemporaneously, improvised, that is to say, hip hop we're talking about and rap. And also um, it's typically not uh, written out because there's a, an improvisatory element to it, which, which ties into the uh, spontaneity I alluded to earlier. So we have this uh, motif, this um, call it a, the technical term for it in music is an ostinato pattern. Ostinato comes from the Italian word 
uh, which is, is very similar to the English word obstinate and actually means the same thing. It's a repeating pattern. And uh, so musically speaking, if you were accompanying this as the pianist or the keyboardist in the pit, there's not an awful lot to do. This is more rhythmically driven. So it's more about sort of hitting the rhythm with the left hand. And you can see the cue notes here are written for that. So it's, it's quite fascinating to see this written uh, down in a traditional music notation. Another thing I love about this is how Miranda turns the, um, the elegant uh, chamber of, of uh, Congress and uh, public debate into uh, kind of an urban playground. And this is part of his, his drive, his impulse, as he says it to quote him. Some of you have heard this quote. Miranda famously talked about Hamilton as being America then told by America now. And that is why he, he chose to cast uh, the characters as black and brown actors and actresses, America then and America told by America now. So this idea of the urban playground with um, the onlookers uh, ooing and eyeing and hooting and hollering and cheering and booing and hissing, uh, it's, a, it's a very cool way to present something that obviously did not transpire exactly as it's presented here. But the acrimony and the divide between the emerging political parties of the 1790s, that much is accurate. And uh, once again, Miranda seems to strike that perfect balance between uh, putting us back in that history 220, 230 years ago, and also updating it for a modern audience so that the aesthetic is something that we can uh, more easily relate to. So here is cabinet battle number one. So we're about halfway through the cabinet battle, or at least the, the main thrust of the cabinet battle. Now we're going to hear Alexander's rejoinder. But as I said, the political ideology is laid out with great clarity so that even if one weren't particularly inclined to uh, be interested in late 18th century American history, uh, you could really easily wrap your head around the basic ideological divide between these two emerging uh, principal characters in the uh, beginning part of act two. So, um, Here's Jefferson, we, when Britain taxed our tea, we got frisky. Imagine what will happen when you try to tax our whiskey. All right, Washington, who's sort of the moderator of this debate, asks Alexander for his response and we're gonna get it. Here's a great example of leitmotif making its way into the pit. Uh, this is one of uh, Washington's main themes from act one. So here Washington is kind of off to the side with Hamilton. And uh, he's going to stress to him the need to compromise, the need to get the votes, because as Madison and Jefferson point out, with a, a kind of a ha-ha that uh, would, would make Nelson from the Simpton, Simpsons uh, proud, uh, they taunt him with the fact that he doesn't have the votes to carry his plan out. So here's the end of the cabinet battle. Well, what happens next is that we segue into the next number. And I'm gonna skip it only because we don't have time, but it's actually one of my favorite uh, numbers in the, in the entire show. And last week, the, uh, the NBCC musical theater class uh, presented uh, a showcase, which was streamed on YouTube. And I can, uh, I'll put the link up on my, uh, my YouTube page, uh, my, excuse me, my uh, Facebook page. It'll, it'll link you to YouTube. Um, and the, um, I thought this was one of the strongest numbers in our Hamilton set. We had a couple of really, really uh, talented girls singing the roles of Angelica and Eliza and a really uh, talented guy who uh, was uh, singing and rapping the role of Hamilton. And we even had someone up there as Phillips. It was very, very cool. It was presented, I thought, uh, very effectively. But essentially in the number, uh, Alexander is... Um, it's, you know, we're heading into the summer and of course uh, most politicians are taking a recess from their work so that they can uh, go and, and uh, spend time with their wives and families. But um, Hamilton is unwilling to do so. And in fact, when his wife says, you know, let's go upstate, my father has a house, there's a lake I know we can go and it would be so romantic and relaxing. And my sister's coming, Angelica's coming from England and it's, it's just going to be a, a respite that we all need. And of course, Hamilton says, I can't. Um, and the, the song takes this very eerie twist towards the minor at the end. It, it ends, uh, most of the song is in E major, and uh, then it goes up to F major at the end. And uh, I only mention this because at the very end of it, we get um, these recurring uh, motif patterns, these light motifs again, that um, are, are really telling. They, they kind of tip us off to where the drama is heading by introducing the minor mode. And I'll show you what that looks like. 
song is called Take a Break. I think I mentioned that, but if I didn't, it's called Take a Break. At the end of it, it gets very animated and there's some beautiful belting from uh, El and Eliza and Angelica. And then on the last page, Alexander says, I have to get my plan through Congress. And you see here, even if you don't read music, you see this FM means F minor. So we really turn towards the minor mode here and that's going to set up the next number. And we'll listen to this one because it's a very important one and it introduces one of the most important uh, arcs of act two. We know, and we can suppose, even if we didn't know, that Alexander Hamilton was likely not the most attentive husband in the 1790s. And of course, there are only 24 hours in a day and with a man as ambitious and productive as he was as a politician, as a statesman, as a scholar, um, it would have been impossible for Alexander to spend the, the amount of time that, that would have no doubt pleased his wife and, and growing family. He would eventually have eight children, by the way. Um, a lot to say about those children, uh, some of whom had very tragic ends, even more tragic than Alexander himself. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But um, with the song like Say No to This, you can imagine that Alexander is about to make a big mistake. And for those of us who know the history, while his wife and children were summering in upstate New York, Alexander was in, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, where he was attempting to, uh, I guess you might say, grease the right cogs to get his plan through Congress, as he says at the end of the previous song. And uh, of course, our trusty narrator, Aaron Burr, begins the number, echoing words that we hear in the very beginning of the musical in the fifth or sixth number in, in the Schuyler Sisters, the fifth, sixth number, I think. Um, and in the Schuyler Sisters, Burr um, also narrates the beginning of that one. Here, there are no Schuyler Sisters present. Alexander's present, and he's in a big city. And we get this cello line, which begins solo, and then it's harmonized with more ambiguous harmony. We've talked a bit about ambiguous harmony with respect to Jefferson. Here, it doesn't have that upbeat um, New Orleans traditional Dixieland style jazz quality, but it is jazzy because some of these chords are, um, well, they're, they're not functionally related, which is to say as listeners, what we're gonna hear is we're gonna be kind of pulled in two different directions. A music theorist would say, is it C natural or is it C sharp? Is it F natural, is it F sharp? But for us, I would say, the decision is for Alexander, do I make a bad decision and indulge in, in uh, the pleasures of the flesh with someone who's not my wife? Or do I do the right thing and walk away? And of course we know what he does. He succumbs to the temptations of the flesh and he does uh, have this affair with this woman, Mariah Reynolds. But then the plot thickens and gets even more sordid, even more prurient, even more lascivious, even more lubricious. Well, that's a, a fancy way of saying that uh, it gets dirtier. And rather than tell you what happens, we'll listen to it. And then I'll give you some notes about um, the real Reynolds affair versus uh, the one that's portrayed and depicted in the musical. So this is uh, fairly early in act two. Again, Alexander's all on his own and he's, he's tired, he's frustrated. And of course, here comes Mariah Reynolds and the rest is history. Here is Say No to This from Act Two of Hamilton. A quick pause here. One of the uh, the details in the music, which I think is very telling, is right when Alexander says her mouth is on mine, I don't say no. Well, we're not going to get graphic. We're not going to get lubricious. We know what happens next. Uh, the affair is consummated, I guess, if we wanted to state it in the most diplomatic terms. But one of the things I love in the in the pit here is the sudden flurry of animation that comes up in the, uh, you can hear it in the keyboard, for example, it sounds like almost like a harp setting. The harp is traditionally uh, thought of as a very romantic instrument, a seductive instrument. And that's what we get here, are these sweeping harp arpeggios and scales. And uh, that's something that might escape your notice, but if you have the score in front of you, you can see it, even if you don't read music, you'll notice this flurry, this frenzy of activity. I'm just gonna back it up a little bit. You can hear from the time Alexander says, um, her mouth is on mine, how simple the accompaniment is. And then when things get, well, for want of a better phrase, hot and heavy, notice how animated it gets. In other words, the music tells us everything we need to know about what's happening on stage. We can't depict the physical act, so the music has to tell that story.
Did you hear those harp arpeggios? It's very, it's a very clever choice of orchestration. And of course, I don't, there's no actual harp player that can be done on a keyboard patch, but it has that quality of, of a running, you know, in the, uh, a movie, for example, if you see someone running their hands up and down the harp. So it's, it's quite effective. And um, one must say, uh, kind of an inside nod, I think, to musicians or those with keen ears who are paying attention to the orchestration there. Um, all right, we go on and uh, now we're gonna meet uh, Mr. James Reynolds, not a good guy. And uh, his heel status is not something that had to be exaggerated for the purpose of the musical. The real James Reynolds seems to have been a particularly degenerate uh, scumbag. I don't think it's an exaggeration to call him that, but we're about to meet him, so here he is. All right, we'll stop there. Uh, it's a really brilliant way to depict the beginning of this affair between Alexander and Maria Reynolds, and then the insidious presence of James Reynolds, James Reynolds, who apparently was uh, not only aware of the affair, but had uh, possibly some historians think cooked it up as, a, as a, an extortion plot. And Hamilton would pay an enormous sum of money to this guy, James Reynolds, to try to keep this news from ruining his political career and, and essentially his, his whole life. Um, the, uh, the numbers are a little bit ambiguous, but it seems most, uh, most historians think that Alexander paid something like $1,300 uh, in, in the early 1790s. To give you some uh, point of reference, um, his entire salary for the year would have been something just shy of $4,000. So we're talking about a third of his salary went to, uh, to hush money, I guess is what we would, a later generation would call it. Now, um, we are going to go a little bit late today, if anybody's wondering when's the program ending. I'm, I've got us scheduled to go to about 8.20. So if you're wondering, are we going to get to uh, the room where it happens? Yes. And then we'll, we'll go to the end. So we have maybe two or two and a half more numbers to listen to, and we should be done in about 25 minutes. All right. Well, Hamilton is going to try to, uh, to keep this quiet, and he does for a time, and it's in, uh, in the musical during that time where he's paying the hush money to James Reynolds, where he finally succeeds in putting his plan through Congress. But Thomas Jefferson gloated to him in the cabinet battle. You don't have the votes. Ha 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 ha. You don't have the votes. So how does he get those votes? Well, this is one of the most interesting uh, dinners that ever took place, I think, in all of American uh, politics. Um, it le leads, of course, to the Compromise of 1790, which we'll talk about momentarily. But it takes place, and it takes place between, um, in the musical, three men. Hamilton, not Burr, he's not in the room. And then, of course, we've met Madison at Jefferson. So these three get together to have dinner in a room with the closed door, nobody else is in there. Nobody knows exactly what transpired in that room. But here's what we do know. And this is a matter of historical fact. We know that after this particular dinner, a compromise was reached. And there were a number of details in this compromise, but here are the essential points, two points. The word compromise, is, of course, suggests that each side gets something. And we know that because Alexander and the Virginians are on opposing sides, we want to ask, what did each one get? Here's what Alexander got. He gets the Virginians to agree to allowing the federal government to assume the state debts that had been incurred during the Revolutionary War. In other words, to put tremendous power in, um, in the federal banking system. What about the Virginians? What do they get? Well, they get to have the American capital designated as being um, on the Virginia, Maryland, in that geographic area on the Potomac River, essentially what's going to become Washington, D.C. In other words, somewhere that's close to home for them being native Virginians. So why would they have agreed to that? Um, well, for them, having the capital close to home, as we'll see, was a, a point of tremendous uh, importance. They felt that the capital city would radiate power itself and was a sort of a uh, an important physical reminder of where power was, was truly consolidated in the nascent country. Whereas Alexander seems to have felt that geographically it didn't matter so much. What really mattered was money. What really mattered was the banking system. And Burr points this out to him in the song. At the end of the room where it happens, Burr says to him, he says, you know, you gave more than you got. And Alexander's, or you got more than you gave, excuse me. Um, in other words, you know, the Virginians, you kind of hoodwinked them. You got the better end of this deal. And uh, Alexander 
is um, at the full height of his political power. We'll see that shortly he's going to have a fall from grace. And we know why that happens, of course. That happens uh, because of the events that we just learned about with the affair with Mariah Reynolds and the hush money paid to James Reynolds. But there's a wrinkle in that story that I don't think anybody could have possibly uh, uh, imagined back then, and certainly even today, continues to vex and confound people who are learning the story. Before we get that, we'll get to the room where it happens. Again, one of the two songs that Lin-Manuel Miranda claimed were uh, the two best, among the two best songs that he wrote in the show. This one is gonna feature Leslie Odom Jr. very prominently, of course, he originated the role of Aaron Burr. So this is called The Room Where It Happens, and it segues right out of the song we just listened to, Say No to This. So it starts with this uh, synthesized brass. It sounds like phony 80s brass on a keyboard. That's done, of course, on purpose. So here is The Room Where It Happens, and um, it's a longer number, but it's worth listening to the whole thing. A little clever bit of foreshadowing here, right? They're talking about how General Mercer got a street named after him. Um, and the reason uh, all he had to do was die. Hamilton says, that's a lot less work than what we're doing, hustling in the political world. And uh, uh, Burr jokingly says, we ought to give it a try. Of course, Hamilton is going to die at Burr's hands. So the irony here, the foreshadowing, is, uh, is, is quite obvious, I think. All right, we're getting now to the back end of the tune. And one of the things that I love in the orchestration here, it's not clear because this is a piano reduction, but considering that this is essentially a hip hop number with jazzy elements, there's something in the sound of the orchestra, which is completely unusual, not just for this type of number or this show or even musical theater at all. And that's the sound of a banjo. <laughs> The banjo, which had been the subject of many memes in music, uh, people who follow music channels on social media, a much maligned instrument thought of as having a rather unpleasant or undesirable timbre or sound color, and it's front and center here. So keep an ear out for the banjo in the, uh, in the orchestra. Rather than a guitar, it is in fact a banjo, and it gives the tune a very particular twist. So let's keep listening. Certainly one of the most infectious melodies that we hear in the whole show, and it's a show chock full of infectious melodies. But one last thing I'll point out before we move on is um, right at the very end, we have this e-ya-ba-da-ba-da-ba-dum. So it's, it's Hamilton's leitmotif makes its way into the uh, orchestra right at the ending, and I'll play that for you just the last few measures. Did you hear that? Yeah, da, 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 which is in the uh, piano part. It's, it's very clever, very clever. Now, of course, one of the things that Burr says here is very interesting. He says, uh, I guess it's a page up. We, you know, they're talking about the art of the compromise, the leaders save the day, but we don't get a say in what they trade away. In other words, you know, the room where it happens is not just about uh, this decision that's made uh, between three characters in the musical or in history. This is a decision that's made that has tremendous ramifications for the, the whole future of the country. And it was essentially made in a closed room by three guys without uh, any agency uh, being given to, uh, to the people uh, whom it would affect. So it's, it's really a quite interesting line there and, and a clever bit of, um, of not only historical narration, but also, um, you know, one of the, the most compelling musical numbers in the show. And you marry those th two things together, I think, is one of the, the real feathers in the cap for Alexander, uh, for, uh, excuse me, for, uh, for the show Hamilton and for Lynn manuel Miranda, the creator of the show. All right, it's after eight, we've got time for two numbers. So what I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit about the event that would, of course, uh, have sent shockwaves through Alexander's personal life and essentially end his, his political aspirations. And then we'll look at the very last number. So one of the, uh, the numbers is uh, something that takes place within the, uh, the history itself. And one of them is more of a meditation and a reflection on what we, the audience, have seen transpire over the past two and a half hours or so. Now, the song in question is called the Reynolds Pamphlet. And this was a real document. And what's amazing about this document is not just that it was real, but it was substantial in length, something like, 80 or 85 or even 90 pages long. And uh, we're gonna have it summed up in a two minute song. But what we're gonna be looking for in this number is um, 
you know, the, what we want to know about is exactly what was contained in this Reynolds pamphlet. And if it was real, did Alexander Hamilton really write such a document? And if so, why on earth would he do it? Well, let's start with what it was. Essentially, the Reynolds pamphlet is a, uh, was a, a document written by Alexander Hamilton, painstakingly and with significant detail, ponderous in length, excessive perhaps even in its degree of detail that is, uh, is conveyed to posterity, explaining exactly why he had an affair, how and why he had an affair with Mariah Reynolds. Can you imagine anyone doing that today? Well, it would be a weird thing to do, maybe not unheard of, maybe not completely preposterous, but the idea of a political figure, certainly, uh, having an affair and then not exactly justifying it. I, you can read the actual Reynolds pamphlet is available through a simple Google search. He's not exactly trying to justify his behavior. He's contextualizing and uh, giving us, the, the, uh, the audience, his readership, um, a window into what was uh, his mentality at the time that he made those admittedly poor decisions. So the basic story is this. The money that Hamilton was paying to James Reynolds, who uh, has probably the best line, one of the best rhymes in the whole show, where he says, uh-oh, uh, you made the wrong man a cuckold. It's time to pay the piper for the pants you unbuckled. Uh, that's a testament to Miranda's uh, gift of, of rhyming words, rhyming cuckold with unbuckled. Nonetheless, um, there was a financial scandal brewing, and Alexander was being dragged through the mud. Now, what was the scandal all about? It had to do with a fund that was, um, it had to do with the pensions of Revolutionary War veterans. And Alexander was accused of embezzling from this fund. And he was so uh, perturbed and so um, uh, up, up in arms about this accusation. He was so aghast at the idea that his reputation, his name would be dragged through the mud with an embezzlement scandal that he had to go ahead and clear the air and talk about the real scandal. And so what he does is instead of letting rumors swirl and, uh, and um, potentially impact his political career, we know that politicians uh, have endured rumors since time immemorial, presumably. But the thought of even having that rumor about that he had embezzled money was so horrifying to him that he set out to admit to the world uh, the, the sordid details of an affair he had with this Mariah Reynolds, whom we learned about earlier in Act Two. So it's really a, a crazy story, I think, by modern standards. The idea that someone would, instead of simply being the subject of a rumor, that you would rather uh, torpedo your own career and, uh, and of course, uh, do tremendous damage to your marriage and to your family life. Um, you know, some people have called Hamilton um, a kind of a puritanical fanatic when it came to money and, and business ethics. And I think that this story testifies to that, does it not? The idea that rather than simply being the, the subject of a rumor that could never be proven, of course, because he wasn't embezzling money, um, he was so gassed and horrified at the, even the idea of being the subject of a rumor that he, he went ahead and destroyed his own political career um, and, um, and did considerable significant damage to his home life. And uh, most uh, historians agree that Hamilton would have been uh, an, an important and top contender for uh, high leadership positions, perhaps even president of the United States in the election of 1800, which of course he didn't even run in. That was an election that was primarily between uh, Burr and Jefferson, which of course Jefferson would win. So nonetheless, let's listen to the song, the Reynolds pamphlet. It's only uh, two minutes and 15 seconds long or something like that. What I love about this is this one again goes back to that, uh, that sort of Southern hip hop feel and that the characters of Madison and Jefferson are absolutely hilarious here. There is a note of comic relief, I think, which is intentional, even though the subject matter is so sobering. So this is uh, called the Reynolds pamphlet, and it's named after a real document which was written by Alexander Hamilton and essentially spelled the end of his political aspirations. And as I said, also did tremendous damage to his, uh, his marriage and his family life. Here is the Reynolds pamphlet. Did you notice this little introductory figure? It only sounds once, but this is Angelica's primary light motif. Yum, bum, 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 bum. So it's, it's very cleverly done. Of course, the, the harmony underneath is dissonant, unstable, but given the subject matter, that's perfectly appropriate. So even before she speaks or sings, 
Angelica's uh, leitmotif announces her arrival on the scene. For Alexander, this is a panacea for his weary soul. Angelica has always been a kind of rock for him, but as he's about to uh, find, she's not there for him. Now, we're not going to listen to the next number, but it's actually a stroke of, of brilliance what he does. To get into Bern, I think most of the people on this call probably are familiar with Bern. Uh, it's Eliza's big solo in act two. What I love about it is the song itself is great, but what's great is how he introduces the leitmotif with this really, really rhythmically dissonant triplet figure over the uh, this hip hop beat that comes in. In other words, Eliza's music starts to sound even before, well before she starts to sing. And uh, there's two lines here, which are great. Burr sings up on the high G. Have you ever seen anybody ruin their own life like this? And um, it's Jefferson and Hamilton. And Madison say, hey, at least I was honest with your money, which is just hilarious. Uh, because it cuts to the heart of the issue with the Reynolds pamphlet that Alexander torpedoes his own burgeoning career um, because the idea that he was somehow unethical with the handling of money was completely unpalatable to him. So this brings us to the end. And I want to thank everybody who's been on the call for this last hour and 15 minutes. Um, we are going to talk about the last number, and then um, I'll take some questions through the chat function. The last number is another show uh, showpiece for Eliza. And uh, it's called Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. And it's, it's sung from the perspective of Eliza, uh, presumably in her final years or even at the very end of her life, we could say. Now, when was the very end of her life? If you can believe it, the woman lived to be 97 years old, which for someone born in 1757 means that she was born around the same year as Mozart and died almost the same year as Robert Schumann. So let me say that again for all the music historians on the call. Eliza Hamilton was born, let's say, almost in the same exact year as Mozart, about a year off, and died almost the same year as Robert Schumann, two composers whose names are almost never mentioned in the same sentence because, well, they have very little in common. Uh, Schumann wasn't even born until 20 years after Mozart's death. So um, she lived a remarkably long life, good genes, I suppose, what we would say today. But um, the story of Eliza uh, is, is really a, a very tragic one in many ways, not only because her husband died 50 years before she herself expired, but because uh, there was a lot of tragedy with her children. Uh, some of you may know the story of Philip Hamilton, who was the, the eldest son of Alexander and Eliza. And uh, basically, after the Reynolds pamphlet, after Alexander Hamilton was kind of, you know, made into a, a a butt of jokes, as we saw at the end of the last number. There was a, a young New York lawyer named George Eaker who had insulted his father. And so Philip challenged him to a duel and, and was killed. Uh, three years, um, three years just before Alexander was killed in a very similar spot in Weehawken. Um, I see there are a couple questions in chat and I will get to those at the end of the program. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, the very last number. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll to the end of this score, not to the bow music, but to, uh, to the music that, uh, that starts at the beginning of uh, Who Lives, Who Dies. So Eliza is reflecting now on the notion of legacy. And this is a, a, a question and a point that's introduced very early in the musical. In fact, the very first number, which we all know starts yum, ba da da dum, bum, bum, yum, ba bum, bum. Um, it's three and a half minutes long. And it, at the very end of the opening number, I spoke about this in my August lecture on Act One, uh, the characters introduced this notion that the audience members, in other words, us, those of us who are watching or reading about the story or listening. We should know more about this guy, but we don't. Why is Alexander Hamilton such a murky figure in American history? At least why was he prior to the journal biography and the musical? And um, what is suggested early on in the musical is that history was written by his enemies. And of course, to some degree, that's, uh, that's very true. Um, for his part, Aaron Burr, who fatally shot Hamilton, never really expressed uh, regret, or at least not for a long time afterwards did he uh, express regret for murdering his one-time friend. I don't know if murdering is perhaps, some people might take issue with that. Shooting and killing his one-time friend and, um, and political rival. Um, 
we hear from almost every main character in the second act here. We hear from Washington, who starts. We hear from Madison and Jefferson, who we've learned uh, through Act Two have been, uh, uh, I should say, uh, antagonists and, and opponents of, of Jefferson, uh, excuse me, of Hamilton. And yet they're going to praise him in this last number. They're going to talk about how indispensable he was, how how uh, unreplaceable he was, how no matter how much uh, they thought to replace the systems he had contrived and configured, um, there were really no superior systems to be put in place. So when your enemies are paying respect to you, uh, it's a, maybe the ultimate nod of, um, of respect and the ultimate accolade, some might say. But really, although we hear from an, a whole cast of characters, including Burr, including Washington and Madison and Jefferson, um, really, this is Eliza's number. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to play some of it. And then when we get to a certain point, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to play the, um, the NBCC performance from last week so you can see what our singers did with it, what our, our actors and actresses, our musical theater performers did. And I'll tell you a little bit about that production. So here's Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. And again, it's, it's really a meditation on... Eliza's 50 years that she lived after her husband died and how she dedicated herself to consolidating his letters and his personal items and making sure that his story was told and that his importance as a founding father was never uh, marginalized, undermined, or gainsaid. Here's the finale of Hamilton. We'll listen to a little bit of the studio recording from the Broadway cast, and then we'll listen to our live production from last week. Well, it's impossible to uh, to compete with the Broadway cast, obviously. However, I am going to uh, share a production because I'm, I'm so proud of how it went and I'm so uh, proud of the students who performed it. So here's, um, the soloist here is, uh, is named Katie and she is, um, she's a, a student in our, one of the 10 students who are in our musical theater production. So I'm gonna share screens and I'll show you what that looked like. Here are the 10 students who performed last week on our main stage theater, which uh, if you can believe it, accommodates as many as almost 800 audience members. But on this particular night, we had really zero audience members, or I guess you could say we had a handful who were mostly just running on the technical side, making sure the microphones uh, were, uh, were balanced and EQ'd and ready to transmit the sound of 10 singers. Plus you'll see me over on the left in some of the wide shots on the piano. This whole production was very difficult to put together because obviously the singers had to be masked and standing six feet apart from the closest singer. And um, normally we would have a pit orchestra and I would be conducting, but for this production, we had to run with a, a Spartan crew. So I'm playing the piano and you'll see, I'm, if you look closely, I'm not even turning my own pages. I'm using a, a, a Bluetooth device to turn pages with my left foot because in the age of COVID, uh, one can't have a page turner sitting right next to the pianist. So um, it was really an interesting performance, but one that I'm very proud of. And here is the end of Hamilton as sung by the NBCC cast of um, our musical theater production. And of course you can see uh, one gallant uh, audience member playing, but that's uh, Katie Locasio, who's um, singing the role of Eliza and Amelia. Mickey, who is in the role of Angelica here. And I was just so happy with the way this, uh, this performance came out. I wanted to share a little bit of it with you. So now in the remaining time we have, we'll take a look at uh, the Q&A. And of course, I encourage you to put your, um, your questions in the Q&A if you have any. All right, I see Barbara asks, uh, Jefferson and Angelica were best friends when he was in Europe. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Miranda makes about Jefferson's first song is that he's so out of step, he's singing jazz. Yeah, it's, um, it's a sp particular, particularly uh, interesting kind of jazz with that boogie-woogie bass line and the, um, all of the, uh, the pianistic runs that are evocative of music from the 1920s. Uh, Chrissy asks, how can I purchase a piano reduction score? Um, Chrissy, reach out to me on Facebook and I'll, I'll tell you all exactly how to, I can even send it to you for educational purposes. I'll, I'll share it. Um, 
thank you, Barbara says, what a lovely performance performer. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Actually, we the amazing thing about this showcase is that uh, Katie, who sang Eliza there, is not uh, an anomaly in the group. Uh, we had at least, I would say, seven or eight people in the, uh, in the out of the 10, um, who are, you know, principal character material in any community theater production. They're that good. They're really, I was very lucky this semester to work with a group of uh, supremely talented, uh, mostly girls and a couple of guys. But Pat, so it goes in most musical theater productions. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, there's an imbalance, shall we say. But, um, but I was really impressed by, you know, some Amelia who you heard sing the role of Angelica there. Uh, rapped and sang the role of Alexander Hamilton in Say No to This. And she was amazed, she, she's got this beautifully expressive voice, but she can also get down into the very low range uh, to uh, convincingly pull off Hamilton. So it was a lot of fun. We, you know, we're just very grateful to the NVCC administration because to be candid folks, most, um, most arts departments are not doing this right now. What we did was, was very unusual. We had to work hard for it, but we got to do it and it was a blast. Well, this has been wonderful, Gil. Thank you so much. And I just hope that everybody knows that you will be joining us in two weeks from tonight on December 15th. And Gil is going to take us through how Handel's Messiah became a holiday tradition. So we'll look forward to that in two weeks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pat, Darian Library, and of course, to the community for coming out and, and watching. The that program. was fabulous, Gil. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. I'll see everybody in two weeks. Until then, stay well, and I look forward to the next one. Okay.